we invite you for the plenary session. Europe whole and free. An idea of the past or of the future? How has the Europe whole and free concept impacted today's shape of Europe? What are the major threats to the preservation of the idea? How should we be sharing the burden of preserving a Europe whole and free? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues. My name is Bobo Lowe, and I have the pleasure to moderate what I think should be a most stimulating and lively discussion on an issue that touches us all deeply, namely the future of Europe. And to discuss this really important subject, we have a most distinguished panel. Let me just introduce them briefly. To my immediate left is Hannah Hopko of ahead of the Committee of Foreign Affairs in the Ukrainian Rada. To her left, we have Sophie Katsarava, uh, Chairperson of the Committee on Foreign Affairs in the Georgian Parliament. And to her left, we have Katerina Matyanova, Deputy Director General on General Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiations in the European Commission. And finally, to the far left here, we have Delphine O. Uh, Commission on International Affairs in the French National Assembly. It looks like we'll also be joined by a fifth panelist, Anna Maria Anders, the Secretary of State in the Chancellery of the Prime Minister of Poland. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today I think we can agree Europe is experiencing an extraordinarily difficult period. It's experiencing, in my view, a more difficult period than at any time in the past three decades. And so the positive vision of a Europe whole and free faces an array of critical challenges. And just let me just briefly go through them. There's the rise of nationalist populism. There's the fracturing of once common norms and values. There's a deteriorating security environment. There's growing economic and social inequalities. There are fundamental disagreements over migration and refugee policy. Discord over the very value of multiculturalism. Of course, there's climate change and environmental degradation and an array of external challenges. An aggressive Russia, a globalizing and increasingly ambitious China, and a unilateralist America. So our purpose today is not to really debate how we got here, but really to look ahead and discuss where we in Europe go from here. And accordingly, I want to ask our panelists here, but also you in the audience, two large questions. The first is, does the concept of a Europe whole and free remain a worthwhile and realistic aspiration? Or is it an idea that's had its time? It's increasingly obsolescent in the world in which we live. Should we be preparing for a more differentiated Europe, characterized by contrasting values and significant differences in policy and in policy approach? The second question ties with the first, which is, if we think that the aspiration of a Europe and whole and free remains valid, remains desirable, then what are we going to do about it? What concrete steps should we take to make sure that this isn't just simply a, a pious, messianic vision, but actually a practical blueprint both for today and in coming decades? So I will ask Katerina to set things off. Um, Katerina, please, your, your views on this. Thank you very much, uh, Bobo. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the Warsaw uh, Security Forum. It's my first time uh, here. And uh, I've been given uh, very few minutes to, to respond, so I'll try to um, do it in a snappy way, as we were asked. 
Well, first, let me say that I'm a firm believer in the vision of Europe Holland Free. Um, in fact, in 2004, in early 2005, uh, I left my very cushy job in Washington and moved to Brussels. Uh, a city with definitely less uh, sun, sun rays than Washington, and to make the enlargement of 2004 a success, to really try to, to uh, build uh, a common Europe. So I'm an unashamed uh, uh, European. And when you look at the roots of uh, the EU, what was, uh, what was there at the beginning? There was a desire to overcome centuries of bloodbath and rivalries and wars. And in that sense, we have, uh, with a very strong caveat, looking at uh, our friends from Ukraine and, and also Georgia, that we actually have a war in Europe uh, currently. But in the EU, that has been uh, uh, overcome, and we had successive enlargements, successful enlargements, although the success of it is not owned by the polity of uh, Europeans as a, as a concept, unfortunately. And we had we seen unification of Germany. But right now, I do agree that Europe is facing some very significant blows. You mentioned some of the global issues that uh, are out there. And it's really going to be up to us whether these are going to be mortal blows or not. The immediate one is Brexit. Uh, the second one, and you mentioned American unilateralism, I think it's a, it's a fundamental threat to Europe for ve one very simple reason. Uh, current administration is taking the, the uh, multilateral world order institution apart, brick by brick. And so it's a question whether it's gonna be one of those bricks that then will let the thing fall down or not. And that is unfortunately something that's uh, very difficult for Europe because it's been very much used to the, the US playing the first fiddle. And uh, at the time of successive crises, it's, it wasn't easy for Europe, but in fact, the approach and attitude of the, of the current uh, administration really mobilized a lot and, and accelerated a lot of the processes that would have taken years and years to, to go through, uh, building uh, some of the security apparatus and, and, and defining its ambitions on the, on the international stage a little more coherently. As President Juncker said uh, in his State of the Union address, that finally it's time for Europe to be Weltpolitik fertig. So, uh, uh, able to actually play its role on the, on the international stage. So um, it's both an opportunity, but it's also a threat to Europe, the, the erosion, the external erosion of the, of the international order. But there are two aspects internally that are eroding the uh, Europe whole and free concept in the, in the EU. One is the challenging of values by some uh, member states. And we are in Warsaw, I think we can talk a lot about that, and there was discussion yesterday, I understand. So that's one. And on the flip side, it's sort of this sense of complacency, nostalgia, um, a sense of entitlement that is among the older member states, sort of looking nostalgically back uh, how it was when the world was different and was unipolar and we didn't have, we didn't have this mess. And I think these two uh, create, uh, create really the divide that, and I, I see that there is going to be a breakout session on East-West divide, which is a real issue. And I think so these are some of the internal dynamics that make things uh, uh, complicated and that are unfortunately not allowing to really come to agreement on the fact that 2004, 2007 enlargements were a success on every aspect of it, uh, but it's still challenged. And as to your question and what to do about it, I'll just stick to uh, briefly, seeing the State Secretary is uh, coming on the stage, uh, in our, in my area, which is the neighborhood East and South, that's a very Eurocentric definition of Middle East, North Africa, Eastern Europe, and an enlargement space, which is Western Balkans and Turkey. I think what we are trying to do is really 
export stability, not to import instability, and really invest in resilience, prosperity of countries around us, uh, norms as well, but really work in a tight, tailor-made way and, and support the countries to, to be more stable and prosperous. It is very complicated, and I'm sure that uh, our colleagues from Georgia and, and Ukraine will, will talk about it, you know, how much, uh, how much Europe whole and free means when you are outside of the big bloc uh, inside. But while a consensus would be building on future enlargements, which is not there right now, we can at least help the countries uh, on the path of, uh, of resilience and stability. So I'll stop here. Yeah. Um, Katerina, what you've just said uh, leads naturally to well, many questions, but one question in particular. How can you export stability when there is such an erosion of core European values within the existing area of the European Union? Because, again, looking at it from the outside, it seems that there, there is a kind... Of, it's not just in the United States or in China or in Russia. There is a, a general attitude of um, make my country great, i.e. separate from uh, <laughs> the European Union or separate from the constraints of the European Union, and my country right or wrong. How do you address fundamental conflicts like that? Because people from the outside think, well, you preach a good game, but what are you actually doing? Well, I think that if you, if you looked at the landscape of what Europe does in its immediate neighborhood, you would actually see a very coherent, uh, very coherent story uh, where we uh, not only are, is Europe the largest provider of uh, foreign aid in the world, but uh, uh, we have really retooled and really entered into very comprehensive partnerships with our countries. The two uh, that are represented on the panel I work personally with, where we really listen to each other and try to invest in things that are of fundamental transformative nature, whether it was decentralization uh, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine or, or, or rural development in uh, Georgia. And uh, energy efficiency, a lot of sort of practical things uh, as well as uh, developing a security dialogue to help in the transformation of, uh, of also the uh, security forces, areas that were unimaginable five, six years ago. So I think you, there you see we also try to be innovative on the financial front. We have put together something called external investment plan to crowd in private sector to, to help uh, magnify the numbers that we can give as, as grants through the private sector involvement. So you actually, I think the, there is not a linear line between the, the tensions and the bubbling and the fermentation inside the EU and the coherence of what to do in the neighborhood. I think there we are fairly, uh, uh, we have eyes on the ball, uh, I think fairly well and, and are supported by the member states in that process. No, that's excellent. Delphine, I wanted to turn to you. Um, oh, your responses to those two questions I set out, but particularly in the context of uh, President Macron's own rather ambitious vision for Europe moving ahead. And I was just wondering whether you could um, uh, address some of those issues. Sure. Thank you for the invitation to the Warsaw Security Forum. Um, as I was preparing for this panel, I actually went back to the original speech where this concept, Europe whole and free, was first mentioned. It's a speech by George Bush, the father, in Mainz, in Germany, in May 1899, so a few months before the, fo the fall of the Berlin Wall, sorry. And there's an interesting quotation in this speech that says, the division of Europe is under siege, not by armies, but by the spread of ideas that began here. And by ideas, of course, he meant democracy, freedom, and self-determination. So thinking back 30 years later, I would say today, Europe, and not the division of Europe, Europe is under siege, not by armies, but by the spread of ideas. Unfortunately, those ideas are exactly contrary, or opposite to the ideas that Bush father was referring to. I think we're going to have more conversation about that, but those ideas, of course, are xenophobia, 
nationalism, populism, the violation of freedoms, the violation of the rule of law. Recognizing that, I think today Europe, in the European Union at least, still exist as a whole, but in order to continue to exist, we need a multi-speed approach. And that's precisely the approach that's advocated by President Macron. I think we've been sort of hiding between our little finger for a number of years. Not everyone, not every member state wants or can integrate at the same space, at the same intensity, or at the same time. So, to quote again George Bush, he said in that speech, we need a continent that is diverse but whole. So I would say that's exactly what President Macron is trying to advocate right now. I kept to my three minutes. No, you certainly have. Um, how successful do you think is he in convincing others of that vision? Because I was reading a recent piece at the Center for European Reform. And they were talking about two problems with the uh, Macron vision. One, that other countries within the European Union simply didn't agree with his concrete policy approaches. So that there was a, a divide between France and Germany. Much, and then a, a, a much more, of course, between France, uh, between his approach on, say, migration asylum policy and those of Central European countries like Poland and Hungary and, and so on. So how realistic, it's one thing, again, to, to put a vision, and you need, pe you need the vision thing, but how realistic, how, how much optimism is there still left in Paris that you can actually make at least aspects of this vision a reality? So, of course, his vision that he laid out in, multi, uh, in several speeches that you've all probably listened to in the Sorbonne, uh, also in Greece, uh, in the European Parliament, is very ambitious. There is no way denying that. Um, we must also recognize that since President Macron was elected about a year and a half ago, a lot of things have um, changed in Europe or in the world that have not been favorable to his vision. Of course, Brexit that happened before his election, but also elections in Germany, in Austria, and more recently in Italy. As you know, we have many problems, many issues with Italy right now. But one interesting thing, I think, in his vision is, I would say, the com comeback, the return of the idea of sovereignty. For long, the idea of sovereignty was actually the um, reserved area for the nationalists, for the populists, and it's still a concept, an idea that is fair, still very much in use in populist and nationalistic um, government, either in Central Eastern Europe, but not just in Central Eastern Europe, more and more also in Western Europe. And the vision of, of President Macron is that we must reclaim sovereignty, we must not be shy, we must not, not be ashamed of reclaiming our sovereignty, but today we must also recognize that in the context of globalization, sovereignty will be best protected through collective security and that means through the European Union or through any kind of collective format. There is no way any country on its own can protect itself from the flow of migration, from cyber attacks, from terrorism, from climate change on its own. It's purely delusional that a country like Hungary or any other country or Italy could protect itself on its own. And so sovereignty, first and foremost, is actually European sovereignty that allows national sovereignty to be protected. Now, that's excellent. I agree, absolutely. The, l Sophie, uh, Katharina mentioned two fundamental problems within the, uh, the European Union. Uh, there's the, the erosion of values, the challenging of, of core values on the one hand, and on the other hand, complacency. Do you see these where you sit in Tbilisi? Are these major problems, or do you think they're actually more critical challenges? Thank you very much. Um, uh, to start with, I agree that uh, Europe faces myriad of challenges um, at the moment, uh, externally, internally, uh, uh, security issues, the ones that you have listed, Brexit certainly, migration, etc., etc. We are all very well aware of the, uh, uh, of the issues that uh, Europe is uh, facing right now. Uh, but uh, this does not necessarily mean that um, we should not be uh, that we cannot keep Europe whole, free, and at peace. Uh, 
uh, particularly from the Georgian perspective and coming from the country, the 80% the of the population of which supports the idea of uh, EU membership and uh, NATO membership, uh, on their behalf uh, and from that perspective, certainly the answer to your first question is yes. Uh, and it's, it's not just the public, the whole political spectrum is united around this idea of uh, uh, EU and NATO, and this is our big vision. Uh, and we know where the destination is, and we are now going through the process back in our country, um, and similarly, uh, like Georgia, uh, uh, Ukraine certainly, and countries like Georgia uh, have, uh, I believe, the same uh, vision and idea uh, about Europe whole, free, and at peace. Uh, and because of that, I will perhaps jump to the second question uh, of house. Uh, and uh, um, I, I believe the member states of the European Union uh, perhaps know the uh, answer better than uh, countries like Georgia, but we, uh, I would uh, like to propose some of the thoughts, how we see it, how the practical house uh, of keeping Europe whole, free and at peace. The first prerequisite uh, is uh, because it is the cornerstone uh, of resilience and security, uh, is keeping open door policy of NATO and the EU. This is something that uh, we have spoken yesterday and we mentioned uh, at the panel where I had the honor and privilege to speak. Uh, when we talk about the security and the resilience and the unity, we should be true to the founding principles of open door policy. And again, speaking of the Georgian perspective, 10 years ago in 2018, um, 2008, Georgia um, uh, was promised NATO membership, uh, an open door policy, it still stands, and at every subsequent NATO summit, this offer uh, and this commitment still stands. But Georgia has gone way beyond membership action plan, as we enjoy all instruments, all practical instruments with NATO, and it is extremely important that we again highlight the fact that no other country has a veto, should have a veto on the decision of any sovereign country. That is very important. Similarly, when we talk about, and yesterday we've heard a number of times of the second threat, uh, and this, more, the, this, the, this panel too, hybrid threats and unconventional threats, um, and all the malign narrative, um, and Georgia of all countries can uh, know uh, and knows uh, what it means uh, to deal with and fight disinformation and propaganda. And we've got our share of uh, experience how to deal with that. Uh, and that is another issue of uh, keeping uh, political, politi being politically resilient uh, to counter uh, propaganda um, uh, and disinformation. Uh, in that, um, in that uh, sense too, I think there needs to be more unity when, because it's not just Georgia or Ukraine or countries outside the European Union who are facing it, but it's a serious and alarming trend in the European countries as well. Uh, and from that perspective, if we show more unity, uh, and share experience amongst European countries and to build a common um, uh, platform of sharing experience, how to deal with propaganda uh, and disinformation, I think that would add value to the general trend of fighting uh, this threat. You spoke about unity, um, but there's a lot of talk these days about a multi-speed Europe. So how do you think that contradiction can be reconciled? So if, if Georgia becomes part of the European Union at whatever time or some sort of uh, association. How are you not worried as a Georgian that you might kind of be relegated to Europe's second, third, fourth division, that, you, that there won't be this unity, there'll just be a multi-tiered Europe uh, in which some countries are clearly much more equal than others? Um, uh, 
Georgia uh, has got a very clear and ambitious agenda to start with uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, EU um, and uh, association agreement, DCFTA, and all the instruments that we have to uh, become member of the EU. What we look at it, the way we look at it, let's put it like that, when it comes to uh, EU membership, uh, it is the process uh, that makes country stronger democratically, economically, security perspective, of course, ha has, uh, has an, a very important role in all of that. Uh, and when we talk about the destination and final destination of Georgia being a member of the European Union, uh, uh, and we are not focusing on that when it happens and in what forms it will happen, we are, uh, but it will happen one day, um, uh, we are more focused on the process at the moment, given the challenges that the European Union faces. If we have got, the, if we are asking the questions in this way right now, this may not be the question seven years later, ten years later, because things change. What is really important for us is the open door policy sure. for security and resilience and for the countries to keep this commitment yeah. the way Georgia is committed to this idea. Okay, no, that's excellent. Hannah, I wanted to uh, turn to you. Um, in addition to the two questions I put out at the beginning, I, I wanted to throw in a third, if I may, which is, do you sense a growing Ukraine fatigue within the European Union, and do you sense any EU fatigue within Ukraine? I would prefer to talk about um, uh, Russian aggression fatigue because for the last five years of uh, uh, military action and occupation of Crimea, also no, mm, non-implementation or total ignorance by Russian Federation of its part of obligation, like guaranteed the ceasefire, there is no progress on long-lasting ceasefire. There is no withdrawal of Russian troops from our territory. There is no exchange of hostages and release of political prisoners. And uh, actually, I'm very thankful that these days at the European Parliament, and today they have to adopt a resolution on the uh, situation in Azov Sea because of the militarization of Azov Sea. So I could uh, talk in this hall today at the World of Security Forum about the um, Russian aggression fatigue, and especially after the speech of Mr. Putin, because all of us, the West, should be in the hell, according to his uh, statement. So, um, uh, as Ukraine is approaching the electoral year in 2019, the same like European Union, Poland. So we have to expect more economic, more security, more political pressure and challenges especially created by Russian side. So we have to express our solidarity, exchange of experience. And within these five years of Russian aggression in Ukraine, I could say that all these threats and challenges we considered as an opportunity because what we managed to achieve. Now we could proudly say that Ukrainian uh, armed forces, uh, one of the biggest forces in European continent, 270,000 soldiers. It's well-trained uh, soldiers with unique practical experience of deterring Russian aggression daily. And also um, last year there were different cyber attacks through viruses and others, so we managed to uh, uh, protect our critical infrastructure, banking sector. So now we could say that how Ukraine could contribute to the European security, because we are really the eastern uh, flank of NATO deterring uh, Europe. So this is about donating, not about asking sure. about more assistance. Yep. Do you think, though, that there is still uh, I mean, you clearly have a commitment to uh, this two-way exchange, um, that Ukraine is not merely a supplicant, but Ukraine can give a lot to a Europe whole and free. But do you think that vision of a Europe whole and free is still persuasive within Ukraine? I think do people still believe in it? Uh, during the Dignity Revolution, Euromaidan, five years ago, and the activists, the citizens, they sacrificed their lives 
for values, fundamental values of the EU. So actually, and for last five years, every day by having association agreement with the EU, free trade agreement, visa-free regime. So this is the achievement which allow us to um, be more integrated within the European Union and also uh, NATO. But I still think that uh, within the EU, I'm really very happy to see that how the 2003 uh, Thessaloniki agenda for the Western Balkans now implemented and we see enlargement in uh, reality. And I hope, and today we discuss with our Lithuanian colleagues in the morning during the breakfast about their vision for 2027, the Lithuanian presidency before 2025, Poland presidency and 2020 German presidency. And I hope that Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova will also receive an um, invitation for um, uh, how to move towards European integration. Because this will be the motivator for Ukrainian political elites, uh, knowing that there is the perspective in the future. So actually opening the doors and stimulating the implementation and focusing on reforms, Ukraine could become uh, not just a strong partner and one day a member of the EU. And this is why the initiative of external investment plan, of so-called European investment plan for Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova, uh, this is also in the interest of the EU because the gap of development between Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova with the, uh, um, our neighbor country like Poland, Hungary will be closer and uh, also it's cheaper to invest uh, export, uh, invest in stability uh, than, than to receive the <laughs> instability. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Anna Maria, thank you. Uh, the, a lot of talk these days about a crisis of values within Europe um, and that this crisis of values means that there are fundamentally different policy approaches on really key issues. These are not just minor policy differences but really go to the core of what the European Union, what Europe is all about, whether it is indeed whole and free or whether, as we were saying before, whether it's a concept that's had its day. Remember, uh, I think we have to remember that the European Union, uh, when it first started way back, was for security. It was after the war. Um, I grew up in England. I think my views on the European Union are actually very multifaceted. I grew up in England, Polish parents. I married an American, and I'm in the Polish government. Uh, so I think I see the situation from three different kinds of view. Um, I remember I was a student in England when, um, there was a, when the UK joined the European Union. And even then, the UK was not convinced. If you remember, there was a referendum in 1975. So we are not so surprised that so many years later, the uh, Brexit still hovers. And I remember <clears throat> the view at the time was, well, you know, European Union, that's nice, but you know, can we really see the Germans and the French and all these other countries that are all have a different culture, different language, can they really cooperate and work together uh, without the, the struggles? As time went on, other countries joined and it was incredibly beneficial to many countries, uh, including Poland. Um, looking at the situation now, um, I am not very happy, I don't feel very optimistic. Um, I was at a conference in Washington not so long ago, and actually the conference was on um, transatlantic cooperation. It was really Central Europe and the United States. And my question at the time was, well, you know, um, I see this more of a problem, is the disunity in Europe. I mean, you think about what's going on. I mean, you know, we have the migrant situation, we have the energy situation, uh, we have... Um, other issues that, um, that are, I think I asked, I think your name was Christina, you said that it was the outside factors are, are stirring it up. Um, I really honestly believe um, that uh, Putin is very happy at what he's managing to do. Um, I think um, I was at uh, discussions in the UK when they were talking about Brexit. And there was a feeling at the time that he was stirring it up because he wanted Europe to break up. Um, 
to my mind, the energy issue is huge. Uh, the energy issue has really divided up Europe because we have Nord Stream 2, which is constantly in the news right now, uh, that I personally think is tragic because it has, you know, particularly for Poles, we have Russia on one side, we have Germany on the other side, and a gas pipeline that goes from one to the other, bypassing Ukraine, Poland, and so on. So we see another beginning of the Second World War. Uh, the migrant situation, to my mind, is even more tragic because there doesn't seem to be an end in sight. So, Europe, Poland, free. Free, yes. I mean, we are not under siege. Uh, we are free. Are we whole? Uh, absolutely not. I, I, I think um, there is a lot of work to be done. And if you were asked to ask me now how to do it, I don't know. So would you say that really the future is not Europe whole and free, but the, the future is differentiated, multi-tiered, and sort of free? I think the future is governed by outside uh, sources. Don't really. outside sources just merely exploit internal weaknesses? Well, I think other circumstances in countries. I mean, you know, we are affected by everything. We have the war in the Middle East. We have Syria, you know. We have no control on that really, you know. We're talking about Ukraine. I'm a great believer in a free and a strong Ukraine, uh, you know, but it is also seems to be without, you know, with, without outside our control. A Nord Stream 2 is also with our, outside our control. So um, when we talk about working together, I don't know. First of all, I think that um, Eastern European nations Central European nations and Western European nations have a different outlook on all this. You know, I listen to even my colleagues here and they think in a slightly different way than, than I do, maybe because I also have the, the slight US tinge to, uh, to complicate things even further. Sure, sure. Thank you. I'm going to uh, open out uh, to questions and interventions from the audience, if you can uh, say your name and affiliation and keep the intervention nice and snappy. So who would like to, um, sir, gentleman in the row there. Yep. I'll take a group of questions. Uh, so I'm Nevin Tyrell, a student. Question for Delphine O. Uh, considering the decline in popular popularity of President Macron, uh, the Prime of the National Assembly, the minister jumping off board, what concrete measures do you have to undertake to uh, create actually unity in France and in Europe? Um, uh, sir? Thank you. Thank you, Spraladze from Georgia. Uh, actually, uh, the whole concept was uh, the Europe whole, free, and in peace. Yes. So that's why when we are talking about the idea we have to keep in mind that this is still accomplished business mm -hmm. because uh, Europe is wider than the EU and we, if we look at the countries who are European countries but beyond the border of EU, yeah. the Europe is divided and not only by ideas, Europe is divided by barbed wires, by fences every day building in my country by Russian military forces, Ukraine is divided, uh, Moldova is divided. So, uh, Europe free, whole, and in peace, this is idea we have to achieve. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, do you, do you want to? Uh, Jonathan Isle from Rusi in London. And my question is to Mrs. Anders, a name that sort of combines both sides of Europe in a historic way. Um, are you worried about the current division between the old and new members inside the European Union? Are you worried about the language that is being used about that? Uh, and is this serious or do you think they're just birth pangs of uh, an integration that are going to go away? I'm going to take a few questions because we've got relatively little time. Sir, in the middle there. In the, in the middle of the middle row. Hi there, um, Bartosz Wawrowski, uh, University of Sheffield. I have a, 
A uh, quick comment. Uh, don't you think, don't you, to all panelists, don't you think that uh, we, European Union as a whole, is supposed to uh, uh, work on uh, uh, unif unifying, uh, re reinventing the idea of unity? Um, I have an impression that uh, multi speed Europe uh, would uh, contribute to the further divisions and completely different ideas of uh, what the Europe means today and what it will mean in the future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, a microphone over there. Yes, sorry. I'll try and do another round after this, but this will be the last question. Thank for you. This round. I'd like to challenge uh, Bobos, uh, my moderator's proposition that the flexible Europe uh, is a kind of, might be a fear uh, for, uh, for Georgia and, and Ukraine. And instead, I would like to ask Katrina and our French representative, don't you think that the flexible Europe model, a multi-speed Europe model, which was proposed by President Emmanuel Macron, may indeed to be an opportunity for Georgia and Ukraine to move forward? while recognizing uh, different aspirations, uh, noting a lack of uh, a political will at this stage to fully embrace both respective countries and Moldova as well, that that could be a way forward towards a gradual integration and accession. Okay. Anna Maria, we'll start with you and we'll swing back this way. Okay, well, let me answer the question that was uh, directed towards me. Um, you asked me whether I'm concerned by the old and new uh, members. Um, no, uh, I'm concerned um, about all the members. I see the division in the, uh, the, the old members. Uh, it's really not a struggle between the new ones and the old ones, I, I don't see. Um, I see um, more of a problem um, with the old ones that seem to be... Um, Monopolizing. I think the real problem with the European Union is not the European Union, it's the European Parliament. The European Parliament, the, the whole concept for me of the European Union has been shot by too much bureaucracy and too many laws. I think that is the issue. And I think if I were going to recommend anything to unify Europe, is to maybe take some steps to change the way that the European Parliament and the European Commission is working, to make it less, uh, less um, bureaucratic. Um, I think this is the issue between um, the view of Central Europe and perhaps Eastern European countries and Western European countries. I always look at it this way. Eastern European countries who are under communist rule for so many, so many years feel that at last they have an opportunity for some freedom of, of expression and they feel put upon. So I don't think it's like old and new. Maybe you could say the new ones are the uh, uh, Eastern Europe and maybe there is that decision, but I think it's not the old and new. I think it's generally a problem for everybody. Okay, thank you. Delphine. Um, yeah, I'll answer two questions. One that was first directed at me and the other about yeah. multi Europe maybe furthering the disunity of Europe. Uh, first one, so I hear this is coming from a French person. I'm not going to answer the internal politics of France, um, but um, what concrete measures can we take or can the French president take um, to further the unity of Europe? I'd say I'd take two very different examples. The first one is about migration. Um, in my view, migration is today not the first threat to Europe. I don't think it's such a threat to Europe, but it's the first threat to the unity of Europe. And I'm not going to be lying about that. I think we're nowhere um, near a solution. Um, there's been a number of examples this summer with the Aquarius um, boat um, that was denied entry to Italian ports that finally found um, some entry either in Spain or in Malta. And President Macron was instrumental in um, finding a solution with these countries. Uh, but I think we're f still very far from a solution. I'll take another example that has nothing to do with security or defense or foreign relations, but I just read about it yesterday, and I thought it's interesting. Um, when we talk about creating unity and solidarity in the European Union, we need, of course, to start first with education, with how we train and we educate our young people. And there's an idea that was put forward by President Macron in the Sorbonne speech that was to create European universities. Today we have the Erasmus program that all of you know, but we don't have actual European universities that would be geographically located in one country, but that would be actually, you know, um, managed and 
um, and by different countries. And so there was um, this idea was put forward, and there was a call for proposals, and six projects were proposed uh, to create these universities. Okay. Okay. Should I right. <laughs> answer multi speed? Very quick. Yeah. I don't think multi speed Europe is furthering the disunity of Europe. I don't think countries, to be very frank and honest, like Poland and Hungary or even Italy in the future will leave the European Union. I think they benefit too much from the European Union. I think we have to recognize that on different issues like maybe defense, maybe the Eurozone, maybe financial integration, maybe those countries don't want to go further with a core of a Euro other European countries. And so I'm, f I'm okay with the idea that those countries with, you know, stay where they are today and other countries with a different group will go further. It's okay. a very short answer. Thank you. Katrina. Thank you very much. I'll make uh, four comments. Uh, one, and as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, there is war in Europe. There may not be a war in the United, in, in European Union, but there is war in Europe and there are barbed wires and there are divisions and there is occupation of a number of the countries. And I think this needs to be, uh, this needs to be stated uh, very clearly. And I also would like to um, go back to uh, Delphine's very nice uh, um, memories of uh, the quotes from uh, George Bush Sr. Um, it's not only the barbed wires that divide Europe and it's definitely not only ideas, it's the hybrid threats that are multiplying and the propaganda that is exquisitely executed, well-funded, and that is undermining the, the core institutions in the European Union is a reality. Is a reality that uh, we need to, need to recognize. So I very much uh, agree with the comment that uh, uh, it is not at peace. I think the, the, hybrid, uh, the hybrid threats is an army just in a, in a different form than we were used to uh, looking backwards. I think in today's reality, it's as, as efficient as uh, sometimes the, the bombs. Uh, second point I would like to make is that I think the East-West divide, and I finished my, my presentation on it, I think is a, a reality. We are not listening to each other. I don't want to pick on you, but, but I hear many times comments, oh, things have changed in Europe, there was elections, this, 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 there, and the other. It's always the old member states. You know, when there are elections in Romania or when there are elections in Bulgaria, it's not, it doesn't get noticed. I, I, I don't mean only on this panel. This is something that one hears uh, very often. So I think that we are not uh, listening to each other sufficiently and understanding each other. And with all due respect, uh, Madam State Secretary, European values and freedom of expression are not at odds. Freedom of expression is one of the fundamental values. I don't think that that uh, that's at stake in the, in the, in the battle between uh, the EU and, 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 and the current government. I don't think it's about freedom of expression. And the fourth point uh, I would like to make to, to Vidaskas' question, uh, if I had, and these are my personal opinions, this is not a European Commission uh, viewpoint, in if I had a blue sky uh, brainstorming, I actually think it could be an opportunity the, you know, to having different tiers, as Delphine was talking about, as an opportunity for, for a ring around to come together. We will have to deal with what is Brexit's uh, uh, status, what is Britain's status after Brexit. We have to come to terms and find a status for Turkey that is a major strategic partner. And I can see that there this could be a, a venue or an opportunity to look for accommodation. Okay. In Thanks. Sophie. Uh, also to echo my um, uh, colleague from Georgia, uh, as we spoke about the security yesterday at the panel, but uh, here is an opportunity again to highlight it. Conflicts in Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova is not only a concern for Georgia, Ukraine or Moldova. This is a threat to the whole uh, Europe and the whole strategic vision of Europe whole, free and at peace. As for the question uh, about um, reinventing the idea of unity, yes, uh, that is... Uh, that is the perspective from Georgia and the countries like Georgia, and I have spoken about it already. Uh, this is our expectation, uh, and this can be achieved through experience sharing, and when we talk about 
old and unconventional, fairly new threats. Yes, we need to share information, we need to share expertise, experience, analyze, and communicate. Yes. Thank you. No, that's excellent. Hannah. Very briefly, reinvent, reinventing the idea of unity. Um, recent example, Nord Stream 2. This is the project designed to split the unity within the EU. Actually, Nord Stream 2 is an existential threat for Ukraine. This is also a big threat for the security of the whole Europe. Instead of thinking about diversification of gas supply, about uh, complying with the third energy package, with antitrust legislation of the EU, we've seen the attempts from Gazprom, exactly from Kremlin, from Putin, to split the EU. So actually, don't trade with principles, don't uh, trade with your uh, values, and this, and you don't need to reinvent how to use. Just uh, remember your values. And uh, when we are talking here in Poland about energy as a key and important, so we are thinking about how to make pressure on Russia to allow countries like Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, others to provide uh, through alternative pipelines and others the sources. So why, instead of pressing on Russia, we allowing Kreml even to have the more monopoly? I don't understand the reason for Nord Stream 2, because the Ukrainian gas transmission system, the capacity is enough, because we are using only 13, uh, 93 billion cubic meters per year, and we have 146 uh, uh, per year. So Ukrainian still could provide no need. Sure. Actually, that, that leads nicely. We're going to have to we've, uh, wind it up now. But I just wanted to ask you all in 30 seconds, if I may. We all agree, I think, on the broad principles of what Europe should stand for. We even agree to a surprising degree, uh, extent about a multi-speed Europe and that it's not necessarily a bad thing. But how are we going to translate these, this broad vision, these broad aspirations into something concrete? So I want to ask you, in 30 seconds, no more, what is, pick one next step, one concrete policy initiative that could at least put us on the way there. I think we need a strong voice in Brussels. One person that has actually got enough charisma and enough pull to be able to make everybody work together. Because I think the real problem is that we are not all speaking with the same voice. There are too many divisions. Yeah. Okay. Delphine? Um, create a unified educational program in yeah. all countries, yeah. especially in the subject of history. Ah, excellent. <laughs> As a former historian. <laughs> um, Katerina? I think in general, Europe needs to up its game on internal unity on the economic fronts to lay the foundations for its ability to act uh, abroad. Okay. Sophie? Um, uh, that was already said, but I was going to say education in the first place yeah. uh, and communication. As I said, communicating, communicating, and education is the core to everything. Yeah. Great. And Hannah? Learn the lessons and be proactively preventing the threats. Actually, Putin has a lot of strategies, how to destabilize Ukraine, how to split the EU. And when I often ask, what is the strategy of EU? Sanctions? Sorry, this is the instrument. Yeah. Um, Madame Mogherini never visited Eastern Ukraine. So this is the answer. Is Ukraine and the war in Ukraine, Russian aggression, a priority for the EU? Okay. Prevent next threats. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you'll agree that this has been a most stimulating discussion, certainly very wide-ranging. Um, it's a debate and a discussion that's going to go on and on, and um, we're all going to be very committed to it, I hope. I just want you to put your hands together to thank our wonderful panelists, Hannah Hopko, Sophie Katarava, Katarina Matinova, Delphine Orr, and Anna Maria Anders. <laughs>